Okay, well, from the, from the squadron, as I say, we were unbeknownst to us posted up to uh, to Gorok, where <laughs> there was a ship waiting <laughs> with 23 or 31 uh, Spitfires in its hole and uh, 31 pilots <laughs> ready to to sail unbeknownst where we were going. And it, so it could have been India or any place or North Africa. So uh, <coughs> we sailed out of Gorg and did a couple of little stops on the way and then across the Bay of Biscay and the North Sea. It was, and uh, that was a frightening thing because I didn't want to get torpedoed and killed. <laughs> Dying in the cold water, the cruel. And as I tell uh, when I'm telling the story, I always say, you know, uh, ours was the wild blue yonder, not the cold, cruel sea. So uh, anyway, we made it to Gibraltar. The airplanes were offloaded, put together. You know, well, the wing put on. Really, that's all. Uh, air tested and then hoisted up. Um, uh, aircraft carrier HMS Eagle and uh, so then when after two days we set sail and now we knew where we were going uh, Malta was ahead so we sailed along the ocean uh, the Med until we were about off the coast of Falgier and of course, none of us have ever flown off a carrier, and we weren't sure that we were going to make it because the carrier's deck was 169 yards. And so, uh, anyway, someone had, one of the airmen at some stage earlier on had designed some wooden blocks, so we were able to, the, the flaps on the Spitfire were either fully up or 90 degrees down, so uh, they designed the block so that when you raise the flaps, it gave it 23 degrees of flap width, or, or um, uh, which gave you the most lift. Supposedly, I don't know. <laughs> they, they tell me that 23 is the optimum. So. Um, uh, now, we were then briefed and uh, what happened, what was ahead, <laughs> and uh, what we were supposed to do. So, uh, so off, uh, my turn came, of course, and just full throttle and full of the whole chocks and down and over they bow, whoop, <laughs> down to uh, not quite reaching the water. <laughs> and then uh, so the game gained some speed. And with flying speed, dropped and flapped. So, you know, and and then, uh, then on, on our way in, before we got to Malta, towards the boat, uh, of course, when we were going along on uh, the Mediterranean, there were a couple of JU-88s off low levels following us, <laughs> telling us they're coming. <laughs> so, uh, so when we got to, close to Malta, uh, I don't know. Could have been 15 miles, uh, uh, but it, uh, out came our friends, <laughs> the 109s, uh, to greet us, and uh, they greeted us so well that they shot down four. <laughs> so out of uh, the 31, uh, 27 arrived, and one act, and, and another one crashed when it landed at Malta, but the pilot was okay. So, uh, actually there was one chap in our section, uh, uh, tail end, 
Charlie got shot down, so uh, luckily <laughs> I managed not to get shot down. <laughs> so uh, kept working away, got into Malta, and um, uh, directed into one of the blast pens, and there was a V2 team and a rearm team. Uh, and the, the operational pilot standing by, so as soon as it was in two, they were ready in case the bad guys were coming over. And I just to digress back a bit, uh, earlier on when we got uh, the WASP, which was the American, they, uh, they did two ships and they carry 47 Spitfire. <laughs> And, uh, but the earth, the, I think the first one, uh, because they hadn't did all the mods or all the, the things they should have done in England, so, and after, I think two days, there were probably only four or six airplanes left, so the 47. So, <laughs> Are not good, <laughs> and so there. Uh, so anyway, I'm posted to 249 squad, uh, and uh, Laddie Lucas was the CEO, a great guy. Uh, he was an MP in England, uh, also a, a left-handed golf champion. <laughs> And also was later uh, was the I forget what he was called, but the, uh, the, he was a, the head guy. Uh, and when the prince or somebody came up to golf, he had to be there. <laughs> had to leave London and to be there at the golf course to be whoever it was that was coming. So, but a great guy. And uh, then, uh, shortly after that, the next group came out, and that had Burling aboard uh, again. Stories are well. Uh, we knew the stories that he had told in England were true because we could watch him shoot down their planes, uh, which we hadn't seen in England. So, uh, so he uh, was there, and some great guys. Uh, and of course, uh, the, the one day that I got, uh, I got off, and it was a nice sunny day, like all the days in Malta. And uh, hey, <laughs> or just another day. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> Um, we had ten airplanes on in the squadron at the day, and I, I should mention that there were days that there were zero available aircraft on the island out of the five squadrons. So, uh, but uh, but on one of those days, yeah. The controller at Chap Call, Wood, Woody, uh, and Buck McNair were in <laughs> on radios and on the ground, and they shot down <laughs> two 109s. <laughs> the 109s that thought they were Spitfires. And <laughs> so uh, that's how <laughs> things were there. Uh, so anyway, this day we had him on, and uh, sure enough, the was coming over. And, and uh, so they scrambled uh, two sections of four, and there was, uh, I was with the flight commander, just the two of us, and so we were sitting on the ground, and of course, we didn't like sitting on the ground because we got bombed. <laughs> so, uh, so we kept 
onto the controllers to scramble us, and finally they did. And of course, because we were late getting off, we did. Instead of getting above the bombers, and we were at the same level. So uh, they were all rather long legs. The flight commander said, "Shall we have to go?" And I said, "Yeah, you know, stupid, yeah, <laughs> sure." <laughs> so when he went and shot down a Ju88, and on his tail was the 109, which I shot down, and then I just knows that there's the number two to that cat. So I'm just breaking away and that's when whoop, <laughs> there was a loud bang and the storm fell off the control column and, and uh, with spinning down and just things not looking too good. A little fire going and so I thought I better get out. So uh, I, I'm done radio cord and have oxygen mask and all that and uh, but I'm spinning so I, you can't get out on the inside of a spin I, I can tell you that <laughs> so uh, I got back sort of on the seat and of course my right arm was useless and I stopped the spin and rolled on my back and dropped out into the beautiful blue sky very quiet ride down and then when I was getting close to the water, I, I heard that when you were over water, you thought you were closer to the water than you actually are. So I kicked off in my flying boots, and sure enough, it, it went down for a way, so I knew it wasn't time to release my capture. So uh, eventually I hit the water. And got my dinghy out. And then uh, things are not going too good. Uh, uh, I know that uh, there's a little CO2 bottle to blow up your dinghy. And I remember the training was that pull the pin out, turn the handle slowly because it's cold. If you did it too fast, maybe it would blow the thingy, so I did this slowly until it got to the stops. <laughs> nothing's happening. So all the way back, nothing's happening. So now, uh, so on the thingy there was a little pump that was attached to it. The thingy was important. There was a little uh, valve there that you could put the pump on. Oh, so I sort of got this arm up, but the stand cord <laughs> wouldn't let me tie the pump. Oh, in, in uh, both in England, well, I guess all the times we were flying, we carried a hunting knife in our, and we used that. To, uh, because in England, uh, there was a lot uh, opening of the dinghy at altitude, you know, just by accident, right? One of those loops or something. And uh, of course, it just pushed the control column, and they're going down pretty straight. And at the end, there's a nasty finish. <laughs> so you, the idea was to get it up and puncture it. So, but anyway, uh, so I got the knife out and cut the cord, got it on, pumped it up enough to, for me to get in. And, well, that was fun.